Hello everyone, my name is Robert Petit and in this talk I'm going to introduce you to Bactopia and demonstrate how you can use Bactopia to analyze your bacterial genomes. Briefly, I'll provide some background, introduce you to Bactopia, present an example use case, and wrap it up from there. So let's get started. I think it's no secret that the last 10 years has brought a lot of fun changes into the field of bacterial genomic and bioinformatics. We've really seen a tremendous growth in the number of publicly available bacterial genomes over the last 10 years. In 2010, we only had about 7,500 bacterial genomes publicly available, and now in 2022, we have more than 1.5 million bacterial genomes available. But we've also seen rapid growth in the field of bioinformatics. From conda, containerization, to workflow managers, a lot has changed that has made bioinformatics more accessible and I'd like to go over a few real quick. The day I was introduced into Bioconda was probably one of the last times I built something from source. Maybe a little exaggeration there, but in all honesty, Bioconda and Conda in general have really helped to put bioinformatics in the hands of more people around the world. Not only is it easy to install tools, but every tool is also containerized and made available as a Docker container, through biocontainers, as well as a singularity image through the Galaxy project. It's truly amazing how easy Bioconda has made it to do things in bioinformatics. We've also seen the rise of workflow managers, which I for one welcome. The things that workflow managers handle behind the scenes, such as moving data between steps, queuing jobs, logging, among the many other things, really help save so much time. More importantly, it helps promote reproducible and reusable science. Some common workflow languages are Nextflow, Whittle, and SnakeMake. If you're wondering which one to choose, I don't, I don't think there's a wrong answer, but it's worth your while to start using one. I personally sat down and tried to write the same pipeline in each of the languages. And as you might have guessed, for me, Nextflow is the best fit. Nextflow is great. There is a learning curve, but each language has their own learning curve. Nextflow supports Conda, Docker, and Singularity, as well as many execution engines from your local desktop, university HPCs, or each of the major cloud providers. It's great to move between each of these environments with just a simple parameter change. And the Nextflow devs also actively work with the community day in and day out, which is quite nice to see. Recently, DSL2 was introduced into Nextflow, which has really changed how you build pipelines with Nextflow. DSO2 has made things truly modular, making it easier than ever to move pieces of a pipeline around, or even into another pipeline. You can string together multiple modules into sub-workflows, which can be quite useful, and you can now reuse channels. Previously, you had to duplicate them, and that could at times become quite a hassle to keep up with. If you're new to Nextflow, I encourage you to start with DSL2, especially since the latest version of Nextflow has made DSL2 the default. Now, whether you are new or old to Nextflow, you should really keep NFCore on your radar. NFCore is a community working together to build and curate Nextflow pipelines. Over the last year, I've learned a lot from the NFCore and really enjoy working with the NFCore community. If you want to see just how far you can take Nextflow, check out the code for some of the NFCore pipelines. One repository you should check out is the modules repo. The repo includes more than 200 modules that are written to be generic and easily used in NFCore and non-NFCore pipelines alike. Also, the review process for NFCore is quite thorough, making for some really robust pipelines. We've also started to see a few platforms for bioinformatics start to pop up. These platforms allow you to bring your own containerized workflows to be executed on each of the major cloud platforms. I think one of the main benefits these platforms offer is the ability for non-bioinformatic experts to rapidly start analyzing their genomes. A few example platforms are Nextflow Tower from Sakara Labs, which supports workflows written in Nextflow and allows your pipeline to be executed on the many executors supported by Nextflow. Hera from the Broad Institute is another platform that has really expanded into the public health space here in the US. It supports Whittle and is available on the Google Cloud platform with Microsoft Azure support expected in the future. One great feature of Terra is the availability of data tables that allows us users to rapidly investigate their results. Finally, the Cancer Genomics Cloud from Seven Bridges allows the ex execution of common workflow language, Nextflow, and Whittle 
pipelines on Amazon Web Services. Each of these platforms has features that others don't, but the ability for non bioinformaticians to rapidly start doing their science is a strength that each of these platforms have. I hope by now I've somewhat convinced you that we have some really great things happening in bioinformatics. For the last 10 years, my mentor Tim Reed and I have been unable to look at this graph and not ask the question, how can we make use of all this public data? I think COVID has demonstrated how useful public data can be for ongoing genomic surveillance, and the same should be able to be applied to bacterial genomes. Even 10 years ago, when there were only a couple hundred Staphylococcus aureus genomes, Tim and I wanted to make use of them. Today, there are almost 100,000 Staph aureus genomes, but now we have the tools to make use of them. Anyone who has been on the public data train will likely tell you it's not all unicorns and cupcakes, though. There are things you must consider. Here are a few things I consider important. You really need to make sure all your samples are processed in the same way. Trying to compare the results of multiple pipelines is likely to cause a headache, and even then, you may be comparing apples to oranges. Another thing to consider is you really want to be using a pipeline that is scalable. I just mentioned there being 100,000 Staph aureus genomes. You want a pipeline that can process all those genomes as easily as it can process a single one. Finally, anyone who's dealt with public data will know there are some very problematic samples out there. So you'll want a pipeline that can catch these samples and allow your pipeline to keep moving. Over time, I've accumulated a quite a fun list of accessions that has some really weird data in them. These considerations led Tim and I to develop Bactopia, a Nextflow DSL2 pipeline for the complete analysis of bacterial genome. Bactopia can process a single genome or seamlessly process 67,000 genomes. And if you're wondering about that oddly specific number, it's because I used Bactopia to process 67,000 Staph aureus genomes in just five days on AWS. Bactopia follows community practices, ensuring it is reproducible. And because Bactopia is built using Nextflow, it is extremely portable, moving between your laptop to the cloud with a simple parameter change. Bactopia can be used for Illumina and Nanopore reads. These reads can be local or available from a public repository, such as the Sequence Read Archive. Bactopia includes more than 130 bioinformatic tools. Bactopia also includes additional workflows called Bactopia tools, which I'll discuss in a few slides, but these tools allow you to dig further into your data. Bactopia is extensively tested and available from Bioconda, Docker, and Singularity. I've also gone through great links to make sure Bactopia is well documented. While Tim and I collaborate regularly on Bactopia, I'm the sole developer and maintainer of Bactopia. So when I first started building Bactopia, I set some principles I wanted to follow that would help make maintenance of Bactopia easier. First, I made sure I would only use tools from Bioconda. This allows me to easily build and use these tools within Bactopia. When Bactopia was converted to DSL2, I also made sure that all Bactopia tools were built using modules that were also available from the NFCourse modules re repository. I think by using these two repositories, as issues arise, there's a strong community that I can lean on to for assistance, which really helps to reduce the maintenance burden of Bactopia. Finally, having seen the rapid growth of bioinformatics these last 10 years, I really wanted to build something that can easily adapt to the next 10 years of bioinformatics because it's bound to be another wild ride. When I designed Bactopia, I broke it up into three parts. Bactopia helpers, which help you get things in place, Bactopia, which is the main per sample analysis pipeline, and Bactopia tools, which are additional workflows for making use of the Bactopia outputs. The Bactopia helpers are just that, little helper commands to get all your ducks in a row. The citation commands makes it easier to get citation information for all 130 plus data sets and tools used in Bactopia. The datasets command is used to download public data sets such as RefSeq and GenBank sketches or PubMST schemas. You can also include your own data sets. But these data sets allow you to supplement the main Bactopia pipeline and further analyze your genomes. Bactopia download handles the building of Bactopia environments for all 130 tools. 
Prepare makes it easier to create a file of file names that you can then feed to Bactopia to start processing tens, hundreds, or even thousands of genomes. And last but not least, and the one I probably use the most, the Bactopia search command allows you to identify all publicly available genomes associated with a query. In, re in return, it provides a list of accessions that you can provide to Bactopia, which will then download and process the genomes for you. The main Bactopia analysis pipeline is where all the per sample analyses happen. What Bactopia does is take each genome and put them through a standard reproducible set of analyses. These analyses include things like QCing your reads, assembling them, and annotating the assembly. Common things you would do for any bacterial genome analysis. Depending on the available data sets from Bactopia datasets, additional steps such as querying all of RestSeq and GenBank or calling variants against your favorite reference genome will also be executed. Bactopia allows you to provide your local fast queues or experiment accessions from repositories like the SRA. And if for some reason you don't have the fast keys available, you can also provide assemblies or NCBI assembly accessions as inputs. I've also built in numerous checkpoints into Bactopia. These checkpoints make sure a sample is good enough to keep going in the pipeline. This helps reduce the number of times a poor quality sample or just plain funky sample would cause the pipeline to fail. These are not hard coded checkpoints and you as the user can adjust them to fit your needs. Once processing completes, each sample will have its results in a standard and predictable directory structure. It is this predictable directory structure that the Bactopia tools takes advantage of. Because of this, Bactopia tools can programmatically select files to be used as inputs for other analyses. Bactopia tools are completely separate workflows, allowing you to do more science. They come in two different flavors. Modules, which are Bactopia tools, consist of a single tool such as Bacta, Collaborate, or TV Profiler, and some workflows which include multiple tools, such as the Pangenome Bactopia tool, which creates a pangenome and core genome phylogeny. Currently, there are more than 30 Bactopia tools for things like antimicrobial resistance, mobile genetic elements, as well as species-specific tools. Nextflow DSL2 has allowed me to completely framework the addition of new Bactopia tools, which helps to meet users' needs. One thing I would like to highlight is, because of DSL2, I can reuse every Bactopia tool. If I want to join two tools in a sub-workflow, I don't have to rewrite them. I can just import the modules. To demonstrate the power behind this, you might have noticed there are a lot of species-specific Bactopia tools. Wouldn't it be nice to not have to know the species to run them? This led me to wonder, can I create a sub workflow that takes every species specific Bactopia tool and executes them based on some logic? And thus Merlin arrived. Merlin stands for the Minmer Assisted Species Specific Bactopia Tool Selection. Yes, I, I did some work on that acronym. What Merlin does is reuse the RefSeq MASH sketch that was downloaded by Bactopia datasets. To determine the distance of your sample to members of more than 10 genera, each being of public health interest. If your sample is within a specified distance to a genera, any species specific tools associated with that genera will be executed. Again, I want to reiterate, because of DSL2, I was able to reuse the existing DSL2 modules for Merlin. I did not have to rewrite anything. Even better, because of DSL2, I was also able to add Merlin as an optional step in the main Bactopia analysis pipeline. You can imagine there are many ways Bactopia and Bactopia tools can be customized to fit your specific needs. And I would definitely be interested in hearing them. With this general introduction into Bactopia, I'd like to take the next few minutes to demonstrate how you can analyze all publicly available genomes for the lactobacillus genus and just a few commands using Bactopia. Lactobacillus is a gram-positive rod-shaped bacterium which is common in both human and animal microbiota. There's been many species of lactobacillus identified that are specifically adapted to a certain microbiota. It's commonly associated with gastrointestinal and vaginal microbiomes and it has been shown to play a role in inhibiting the growth of other bacteria. Lactobacillus also plays a valuable role in the food and probiotic industries. 
And with just a few commands, I will demonstrate how to analyze all publicly available lactobacillus genomes. First, I'll use the Bactopia helper commands. The Bactopia datasets command will be used to download public datasets and lactobacillus specific datasets. I'll also use the Bactopia search command to identify all publicly available lactobacillus genomes from the SRA and ENA. Bactopia search will produce a file with experiment accessions that I can then pass to the main Bactopia analysis pipeline. With the list of accessions and the datasets, Bactopia will download the FASTQ files associated with the accessions and process them through the complete analysis pipeline. I did this for 1,600 genomes in the span of a few days. Most of the samples were good quality with only 100 or so being excluded or unprocessed due to not meeting minimum quality requirements. Considering I was using public data, tossing 6% of the samples due to poor quality was, was not an unexpected. Because I was using public data, my next step was to make sure I could trust the provided organism names. For this, I used the PhiloFlash Bactopia tool to reconstruct the 16S gene and produce a 16S tree. I then used the GTDB Bactopia tool to assign taxonomic classifications. I found that 45% of the lactobacillus genomes were represented by just 10 species, which is not too unexpected. There's a strong clinical bias in available uh, bacterial genomes when it comes to using public data. More interestingly, I identified 48 samples that were not even lactobacillus. Uh, this really highlights the need to do some basic checks to make sure you are working with the data you expect to be working with. My next step was to zoom into just Lactobacillus crispatus, which is a common member of the human vaginal microbiome. First, I used the fast ANI Bactopia tool along with a crispatus reference genome to identify which samples were crispatus. I then used those samples as inputs to the pangenome Bactopia tool, which creates a pangenome using Rory and a core genome phylogeny with IQ tree. With this tree, I was able to clearly see two groups in the phylogeny. Using the available metadata, one of the groups was associated with the human vaginal microbiome and the other with poultry and human gut microbiomes. Although I use this as an example use case for Bactopia, there was a scientific need for it. This analysis was used to help assist an ongoing project I was a part of that is aiming to better understand the human vaginal microbiome and its effects on preterm births. In just a few Bactopia commands, I was able to accomplish a lot in a short amount of time. I used the helpers to build data sets and identify publicly available samples for lactobacillus. I used Bactopia to process each sample in a uniform way. Finally, I utilized the Bactopia tools to filter out non-lactobacillus genomes, describe the genus as a whole, and then zoom into just lactobacillus to create a core genome phylogeny. I hope with this brief use case, you can start imagining ways in which you yourself can put Bactopia to use in your own studies. And before I wrap this up, I'd like to discuss a few more things about Bactopia. When it comes to bacterial genomics and bioinformatics in general, I think Bactopia provides a great introduction for students. Students can see how 130 bioinformatics tools are linked together to help us make use of our bacterial genome sequencing. Because Bactopia is available from BioCon, students can also start using Bactopia in just a few commands, even with little to no knowledge of the command line. The documentation is also detailed enough for students to get started. And with the detailed output description for each Bactopia output, students can even use the documentation to better understand why we are running the tools we are running when it comes to bacterial genomics. I've emphasized reducing the maintenance burden of Bactopia a few times already, and one thing that really helps with this is all the tests. After attending an NF Core hackathon, I learned a lot about how the modules repos makes use of testing and adapted to fit Bactopia. Today, Bactopia includes more than 100 tests that test more than 10,000 output files using real bacterial data, each test being executed on GitHub Actions. Again, I can't emphasize enough just how much these tests have helped me keep the wheels turning with Bactopia. Bactopia gained a lot of benefits by using Nextflow. An important one is by using Nextflow, Bactopia is platform independent. Once you get your config set up, you can easily move from a Slurm cluster, your desktop, or even to Microsoft Azure with a simple profile change. 
I've used Spectopia in each of the major cloud platforms and getting started with those platforms has been completely streamlined by Nextflow, especially if you use Nextflow Tower. With Tower, you can go from creating keys to launching jobs in just minutes now. To make things even easier, the NF Core maintains a repository of config files that you can use or modify to fit your needs. A side effect of my design principles were avenues for Bactopia to contribute back to the community. As I started using Bactopia more, I came across tools that weren't available, so I submitted recipes. And through those submissions, I started reviewing pull requests for Bioconda. Fast forward a bit, and I've now submitted 20 recipes and some related to Bactopia, some not. And I've reviewed more than 1,300 pull requests. Additionally, my requirement to use NF Core modules for Bactopia tools has led me to submit more than 30 modules to this repository, as well as review and pull requests. Occasionally, Bactopia users stumble across bugs within the tools that Bactopia uses, and this sometimes leads me to find a solution and submit a pull request upstream. I think this has really turned into a great synergy with the community, and I've I'm very happy to be able to be a part of the Bioconda and NFCore modules teams. Another unintended side effect of Bactopia is that it has led to a few standalone tools. I think the most impactful one is Dragonfly for the assembly of Nanopore reads. I wanted to add support for Nanopore reads into Bactopia, but I really wanted a shovel-like experience for assembly. Having for many years maintained a Porca shovel that is specific to single-end reads, I was quite accustomed with the shovel code and Torsten Seaman, the author of Shovel, made it super easy to just use Shovel as a framework for Dragonfly and thus Nanopore support was added to Bactopia. There are also other tools like BASQ Download, which handles download uh, from SRA and ENA in Bactopia, as well as the scan tools for getting details about the assemblies and BASQs. And the VCF annotator tool for adding bi biological annotations such as amino acid change and codon positions into the VCF files. It is kind of cool to see the, a few tools that were made to help me do things in Bactopia out in the wild and being used by the community. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap this up. Bactopia has a lot to offer when it comes to bacterial genomes. You can use it for your Illumina or Nanopore reads. It includes a lot of bioinformatic tools, and more than 30 Bactopia tools, which are completely separate workflows that allow you to do more science. Bactopia has been extens extensively tested and is available from Bioconda, Docker, and Singularity. It is well documented and with just a few commands, you can easily start analyzing public data alongside your own data. But I think there's still a lot of room for Bactopia to grow. The conversion from DSL-1 to DSL-2 helped to take the training wheels off Bactopia and expand the potential possibilities. Currently on my radar are greatly improving the generation of results because you are kind of on your own when it comes to looking through the results. I put a lot of effort in the creation of outputs. Now it's time to redirect that effort into the generation of reports. Unfortunately, science moves very fast, and I sometimes get distracted by the urge to add more Bactopia tools, which is always on my radar. Also, I've mentioned how good Bactopia's documentation is, but I think there is room for improvement. Through user feedback, I have on my list a few ways to improve it, such as examples of using Bactopia tools like the use case I presented and tutorials using Nanopore reads. Finally, I'm always looking for ways to improve Bactopia, so if you have any contributions or feedback that you would like to share, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm super excited to see what's next for Bactopia. Before I let you go, I'd like to thank all the developers and maintainers of open source tools. Many of you maintain these tools for free and in your free time, and it's a huge thank you for what you do for the scientific community. Tim Reed, who is as much a part of Bactopia as I am, helps to keep Bactopia grounded in biology. The Emergent Group, who regularly provides their thoughts on improving Bactopia. Davi, Marcon, Abhinav Sharma, and the NF Core Group really helped to propel Bactopia into the DSL2 age, and I'm very grateful for all your help. The Wyoming Public Health Laboratory, especially Taylor Fearon, Jim Mildenberger, and Chase Raleigh, for your constant feedback on how to improve Bactopia in the public health space. The Agent Genomics for their support in allowing me to continue to maintain Bactopia. 
And finally, all the users of Bactopia that submit issues and answer my little survey, I use your, your feedback to direct future developments of Bactopia. And you, the viewer, thank you for taking the time to hear what I have to say about Bactopia. I'll let you go now. Please feel free to put any questions or comments below.